Good afternoon. It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce our invited speaker for the University of Michigan School of Dentistry Pathways Day 2017, Professor James Holloway, the Vice Provost for Global Engagement and Interdisciplinary Academic Affairs at the University of Michigan. Professor Holloway embodies our theme for this year's Pathways Day leadership and student autonomy in education and lifelong learning. He is a demonstrated leader in his field and continues to lead in undergraduate education, global initiatives, diversity, locally as well as internationally. Professor Holloway has many interests, talents, and accomplishments. He began his formal education with the ambition to create the first fusion power plant. However, I suspect that once he began to explore all the opportunities available, his passions expanded well beyond the power plant. In fact, he developed a deep appreciation for and love of teaching on a global scale. His formal education includes a Bachelor's of Science in Nuclear Engineering, a Master's of Science in Nuclear Engineering, a Certificate of Advanced Study in Mathematics from Cambridge, and a PhD in Engineering Physics. As his academic career matured, he expanded his teaching to international venues. As he spent most of his childhood living in Thailand, he developed a sincere appreciation for the responsibilities associated with being a global citizen. This experience has contributed to Professor Holloway's passion of helping students appreciate the importance of the international community in the context of their learning and maturing as professionals. His international academic contributions include a year spent as a guest scientist in Germany, teaching a course in user needs assessment and the cultural context of design for University of Michigan students and African students in Kumasi, Ghana, and he currently teaches Engineering 260, Engineering Across Cultures. In recognition of his accomplishments and contributions to his fields and to his education, Professor Holloway has earned numerous awards for research, teaching, service, and diversity. Likewise, he has been inducted into numerous professional honor societies. He has published extensively in books, book chapters, and peer-reviewed publications. He has reviewed many journals and is past editor of the journal Transport Theory and Statistical Physics, now known as the Journal of Computation and Theoretical Transfer. His research includes investigations on the computational modeling of radiation interactions with matter, and research on engineering education, including student identity and gender in the engineering classroom, with emphasis on a global perspective on scholarship. He is also a co-primary investigator of CRASH, the Center for Radiative Shock Hydrodynamics. His teaching philosophy encourages domestic and international venues for experiential opportunities for students to apply classroom learning in unique ways, ways influenced by global variations in culture, resources, values, as well as population and individual needs. Currently, he is a professor of nuclear engineering and radiological sciences at the University of Michigan, and he is an Arthur F. Thurnau professor this professorship is named after a student who was an undergraduate at the University of Michigan between 1902 and 1904. Upon his passing, he willed the creation of this professorship to be awarded to University of Michigan faculty recognized for outstanding contributions to undergraduate education. Professor Holloway is a leader in engineering, a leader in undergraduate education, a leader in translating the engineering educational experience to a global scale. Please welcome Professor James Holloway. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that great introduction, Nikki. Someone did a whole lot of research to dig up all of that stuff on me. I, I didn't know half of it myself. Um, so, so this is a challenge for me because um, I'm not a student of dentistry and, and so I, I can only relate in, in certain dimensions. Um, as well, it is immediately after lunch and so what your bodies are telling you is to sleep. Um, fortunately, they've given me a cat toy. Wait a minute. 
I have to turn it on. I don't even know how to use it. I'm an engineer, they say. They've given me a cat toy, but they didn't give me a cat. And so I can't entertain you with that. Um, but instead, what I'll do is, is talk for a little while um, about student autonomy and learning uh, and building leadership skills for future, future, professors, uh, future professionals. And so the real point of the talk, the real focus of the talk, is about leadership and what it is and how you develop it. Um, and as future professionals, something for you to think about is leadership and why would you develop it? Why is it important? And it's an interesting concept to pursue at the University of Michigan, because at the University of Michigan, we have this slogan, leaders and best. We want all of our students to be leaders and best. And we're challenged on that constantly. Even folks here will say to us, well, we can't all be leaders. And the folks who say that are wrong because they haven't really thought about what leadership is. And so I hope in part that, that through this talk, I'll give you a perspective on how to think about leadership and what it is and why, in fact, we can all be leaders and how that's distinct from some other concepts that, that we can't all be. And so this is kind of the first question. What is leadership? When we say, talk about leadership, what do we mean? And one of the challenges around thinking about leadership is we frequently confuse it with a different notion. Leader does not mean you're in charge. And that's, that's the fundamental crux of, of why people get confused about whether we can all be leaders or not. We can't all be in charge. But leadership and being in charge are not the same thing. And that's an important distinction. And in fact, there are a lot of people who are in charge who are not leaders, and a lot of leaders who are not in charge. They're really not the same thing. So, so let's look at a different concept, boss. If you, if you do a Google image search for boss, this is one of the first things that comes up. <laughs> and boss is a really interesting word, right? Because even if I don't have the picture there, the picture drives you in a certain direction towards humor. But in fact, we all have a slightly kind of negative reaction to the word boss, right? Um, it, it's, it's an interesting word in the English language. I looked it up this afternoon. It comes from the Dutch. It's good to know. Um, but we do have an interesting reaction to the word boss. But what's a boss? Let's talk about that first. The boss is in charge, so let's figure out what a boss is. This is the Merriam-Webster definition of the word boss. A person who exercises control or authority. Uh, one who directs or supervises workers. So the boss is the person who's in charge. The boss is the person who tells you what to do. The boss is the person who, who directs things, uh, has some responsibility in that direction. That's what a boss is. Here's, here's dictionary.com. We should go internet-y on this. So here's dictionary.com definition of boss. A person who employs or superintends workers, a manager. Um, a person who makes decisions, exercises authority, dominates. Interesting words in this, right? Control, dominates. Maybe that's part of the reason we have a negative reaction to the word boss. The word boss comes with a whole lot of baggage that particularly in, in this culture in the United States, doesn't actually sit very well. We don't like the notion of dominate. We don't like the notion of control. So here are words that, that come up when you think about boss. Responsibility, sure. Authority. A boss has authority. They have authority to tell people what to do. They have authority to set pay. They have authority to fire. They have authority to give assignments. You'll do this work. You'll do that work. Uh, there's a real sense of control. Bosses are control things. And bosses are in charge. So, so when we think about this question about leaders versus uh, does leader mean in control, boss definitely means in control through a whole set of mechanisms, mechanisms of control, dominance, authority, responsibility, and so on. Um, but those last two words in some ways are key to making it boss and not something else. So let's talk about leader. So if you Google leader, this is one of the first pictures that turns up. That's a very different image, right? So one of the first pictures that turns up when you Google boss is this picture from the TV show The Office. It's a ripoff of a much better British TV show, but never mind. Um, but it's a picture of a boss that we all have a kind of a negative reaction to. The boss in The Office is portrayed in a, in that case, it's the buffoon boss, right? It's the boss who doesn't really know very much, but pretends that he does or thinks that he does. He doesn't even pretend. He thinks he knows a lot and doesn't. Uh, and therefore is ineffective in exercising control or dominance. And so 
we see him as a bad boss because he's identified as a boss but doesn't control or dominate. Um, but if you Google leader, you get a very different image. And this is an image where there's, there's actually, there, there's still some similarity. There's still someone who is in a privileged position here. But their position of privilege doesn't clearly come from some set of authority that they get to dominate. They appear to be doing something with this group of people. And the thing they appear to be doing is persuading, evoking something. They appear to be inspiring. The whole way this image is constructed is designed to do that, right? I mean, this, this placement of the hands and the arms is very purposeful. And, and its selection in this image is very purposeful to, to evoke something that is open. Right? This is an open gesture in, in, in human interaction. So this person is not pushing away, not dominating, not superior, but rather welcoming. And yet still in some, some kind of privileged position. So this notion of leader is different. And so look, look up leader. Leader is fascinating to look up in the dictionary. Merriam-Webster says the leader is a person who leads. Well, that's helpful. <laughs> it's surprising how few words there are to describe leader compared to boss. And by the way, this is not the first entry if you look up in Merriam-Webster, look up the word leader. Um, before this are a whole set of other uh, definitions of the word leader, including a, you know, a term from typesetting. Leaders are those dots that run across a page. That appears before this definition in Merriam-Webster's dictionary. This is a much fuzzier word somehow. And so in the dictionary, it's described in very few words. It's described in a circular way, person who leads, um, and is kind of buried a little bit in the, in the dictionary entry. Because this is a less well-defined term, less well understood. Vocabulary.com, we got to do the internet thing. Um, by the way, I would have used dictionary.com, but at the moment that I tried to look up dictionary.com definition of leader, the site crashed, so I went to vocabulary.com. Their entry is a person who rules or guides or inspires others. This is an interesting definition too. It, you kind of wonder why did they put rules in there, right? So rules in the sense of a, of a, of a monarch which is an archaic notion. There's, there's kind of a, an attempt by the person writing this definition to remember, oh, well, you know, a king is like a leader, a queen is like a leader, but it's an archaic notion. And the other two words seem more interesting, guides and inspires. And very different, evoking very different imagery than the words associated with boss. Okay, so the dictionaries are not giving us very good definitions of leader. Interestingly, the best place you find definitions of leader is in business literature. Business schools run leadership programs, they study leadership, and that's where you actually find the, the deepest thought about what a leader is. And so here's some definitions from business leader. These are from yesterday, uh, two days ago. Uh, this is Business News Daily from March 29th. Um, it's so easy to find discussions of leadership in the business literature. You, you don't have to look back five years or two years or whatever. Two days ago, you'll find something. Um, so this is a quote from, from Katie Christie. This was an article on 11 definitions of leadership from the business literature. Um, a leader should be the humble, authentic expression of your unique personality in pursuit of bettering whatever environment you are in. Wow, that is so different from boss. That is so different from in charge. Nothing here suggests in charge. There's some things here that are very evocative and to think about what it means to be a leader. Well, one is humble, great word. Authentic expression of your unique self. It's something, there's something very internal here as well. Bettering your environment. So how you impact the world. So there's something here about approaching the world in a humble way, thinking about yourself, reflecting on yourself, and thinking, how do I make the world better? And this is a business school's definition of leadership. This is a business magazine's definition of, of leadership. Some others from that same article. Um, a leader is someone who has the clarity to know the right things to do, the confidence to know when she's wrong, and the courage to do the right things even when they're hard. Again, there's no sense here of in charge. There's a sense here of looking at the world and figuring out these are the right things to do. I'm going to impact the environment, change the world through my actions. 
I figured out the right things to do, but now we're not done. It's one thing to know the right thing to do. It's a different thing to act. And so the courage to actually do them even when they're hard. And also the courage, again, there's a self-reflection notion in here to know when you're wrong. So in the previous, it was about being humble and understanding your unique, authentic self. That's a self-reflection idea. Here, the self-reflection idea is around knowing when you're wrong. So again, very different language around what does it mean to be a leader than to be a boss or to be in charge. And one more, this will be the last from, from this particular um, article. Leadership comes from influence and influence can come from anyone at any level and in any role. So a very explicit statement. Leadership is not about being the boss. It's not about being in charge. It's about influencing your environment. It's about influence. Connect that to the previous. Influence towards what aim? To ch in change the world, but to do the right things, to better the world. That's what leadership is about within this set of definitions. And so the words we're hearing for leader, bettering, confidence, influence, courage, very di evokes very different imagery than uh, the notion of in charge, the notion of authority, the notion of dominance, the notion of control. This is about knowing yourself, understanding your own values, knowing what is right, and doing those things that are right to make the world better to change the, the environment outside yourself. And I think that'll be an important notion to think about in a little while, this notion of your internal self and the world outside. So let's talk about influence. What is influence? Influence is causing action in something, right? And so the, the, I, I search for good images to represent uh, influence, by the way. One of the first ones I found I did not use because it's a picture of a set of dominoes. If you Google image search for influence, you find a lot of pictures of dominoes. You know, one domino knocks over the other. So the first one influences the whole chain. And one of the first images of that nature that I found was the sequence of dominoes falling over. And, and at the very end of the chain of dominoes was a, a little tiny planet Earth. Like, wait, we're gonna crush the Earth. It was a horrible image. Um, but this one I think is pretty good, right? So there's, there's something that all of these plants are leaning towards. They're leaning towards the light. They have a vision of something, and they're leaning towards that vision. They may not achieve it, they're not gonna reach the light, but, uh, but there's an influence here that is causing these plants to lean towards that vision, lean towards that light. Influence is about persuading, it's about inspiring, it's about values and vision. And values are important in this. And values is something we do not talk about enough. As a, as a university, we don't talk about it enough. As individuals, we don't talk about them enough. All the decisions we make are deeply rooted in our values. And when you see someone making decisions that you think are irrational or against their own self-interest or, or that don't make sense, Almost in every case, you haven't actually understood their self-interest, and most importantly, you haven't understood their values. Almost everybody makes decisions that are totally rational within their own frame of values, and we have different values. We learned them from our mothers, we learned them from where we were this high, and we can't un unpack them very well without a lot of work. Our, our values, the things we hold most dear, are so deeply ingrained that it actually takes a lot of work to unpack those, to pull them out and look at them. One of the reasons I, I think it's important for us to engage in the world, for students to engage in the world and engage in other cultures, is one of the ways you discover your own values is to bump up against somebody else's in a very explicit way. And that's what happens when you engage in another culture and people make decisions based on different values and it becomes much easier to see that. To recognize that in fact all of us in, that, in this room do the same thing Many of us have grown up in a relatively common culture, but even within that culture, we have different values. And values influence decisions because they influence what we think is right. And so when we think about influence, influence is about causing action. Influence is about me thinking about how to cause action in others. But within that, it's deeply rooted. The things I choose to influence, the reasons I do so, and the means I use are deeply rooted in my own values. 
And there's an interesting question then. How do we learn to influence? How do we learn to influence others? And we'll park that question for, for just a minute. Let's talk about courage. That was the, another element that was, we could find within those notions of leadership, doing what is right. This is about making choices. It's about decisions. It's about action and doing. And so courage or, or doing what is correct, doing what is right, it's about deciding to act. And it's about deciding to act. Sometimes it's not hard. It's actually not interesting when it's not hard. It's not courage when it's not hard. It's courage when it's hard to act, but you know what you need to do and you know how to act, and you choose to act. And courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is overcoming that fear. Courage is acting in the face of opposition, in the face of criticism, because you are acting in a way that, that you know this is the correct thing to do. That's what courage is. And courage is important in leadership. Because the interesting things, that, the, the important things that we have to do as individuals are going to be the th ones that require courage. They're going to be the ones that are hard. They're going to be the ones that are sometimes opposed. It's really nice when we all agree and we're going to do this thing. Um, that probably wasn't the most important activity that we will engage in. It's when there's really some lack of clarity about what to do, and yet there's some clear vision about the directions to move. And so there's an interesting question. How do we learn courage? How do we learn to act? How do we learn to act? We're not always very good about teaching that either. So we're not very good about teaching people to think about how to influence. And we're not very good about teaching people to think about uh, how to act, how to take an action when it's necessary and when it may be hard. And so it's interesting to think about how as an institution can a, can a university create learning environments in which you learn to act, in which you learn to influence. Because how do you learn these things? So courage and influence, these are the, the two elements of leadership that I particularly want to focus on here within this issue of autonomy. Because the, the, the topic here was autonomy for students and how that leads to s developing leadership skills. So we have, to, we have to do what's right. That's courage. Um, and courage is an action that I take to change the world. Influence is an action that I take to get you to take an action to change the world. So both of these are about action. They're both about influencing the world, and both of those went back to those definitions of leadership. Those definitions of leadership talked about how do I think about my own internal value system, my own internal understanding of what we should do, and transmit that into action in the world. That's what these two things are about. Me acting and me getting you to act. And to do these, we need vision. We need action. We need values. And how do you develop them? Practice and critique. You don't learn them by studying in a book. You don't learn them by listening to a lecture about how to act, how to take an action in the world. You don't learn about them by studying a lecture about how to influence. Those things can be helpful. It's useful to have a theoretical underpinning. But in the end, these are experiential activities. You learn to influence the world by trying and seeing if it worked. You learn to act in the world by trying and seeing if it worked. And most especially within a learning context and the kind of thing that, that we can do within a university, you try to act in the world and it works or it doesn't and you get critique and feedback. Your professors tell you, yeah, this could have worked better this way. Or what do you think would have happened if you had taken this choice instead of that choice? That's where you're learning to make choices, to make decisions. That's where you're learning to influence the world. And it's not always apparent at the moment you're in it. At the moment you're in it, it just feels like this annoying professor is criticizing me, and it's really painful. But in fact, what you're learning in those moments of critique, those moments of feedback, is how to act in the world. You're getting information that you can reflect on. This is that self-reflection piece. OK, I made this action. This thing happened. Other ideas are presented to me about how I might have behaved, choices I might have made, how those might have come out, and I can use that information to change how I may behave in the next 
in the next go round. So that whole process of forcing you to make choices, make decisions, and then giving you feedback on those decisions, that's a place in which you are learning to influence the world and to make choices. That's where you're learning leadership skills. And I think, again, that's not always apparent to you as students when we, when we put you through that process. Um, and so when, you th when, when people talk to you about, you know, well, we're the leaders and best, you think, where did I learn that? It wasn't on the syllabus. But actually, it wasn't on the syllabus because it was in the action. It was in the learning process. It's not a topic. It's something you practice. You're in a practice-oriented discipline, and so you know the value of that. You know the importance of that. And what I'm saying is that beyond technique, beyond learning techniques of dentistry, you've actually also been learning techniques of leadership through that same kind of process of trying, getting feedback, getting critique. But it's around the choices you make. It's around the decisions you make. Because leadership comes from that ability to act and make decisions and do so with courage and based on your values. And your ability to act, this, to come back to that issue of autonomy, your ability to act as, a, as an individual human being exists because of autonomy. We have individual autonomy. Or psychologists would say, we think we have individual autonomy. Um, there's, 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 well, I'll, I'll quote something in a minute about that. Um, but the point is that because you can make a choice, you can make a decision. You can influence the world. You can make some. Uh, you can choose between this path or that. If you didn't have a choice, if you were set up in a, you will do this and then this and then this and then this, you would never learn that process of making choices. And I know that, that certainly the students I teach, the thing they like the least is when I make them make a choice, make a decision. Should I use this approximation or that? I'm not, you decide. See where it goes. Should I use this technique or that? Well, you decide. See where it goes. But it's those moments when you're actually learning to be a leader, when you're learning to make decisions that will influence the world, when you're exercising your autonomy. Because like everything else that humans have, all of our skills, our, our, our muscles, our physical capabilities, our mental capabilities, they grow with practice. And so when we force you to practice autonomy, you're developing those skills of leadership that are really important and that we as an institution think are critical. And not every institution pushes that in the same way. This institution really does push the notion that we want all of you to be actors in the world. We want all of you to make a difference in the world in whatever role you're in. It doesn't matter if you're in charge. We do want you to be leaders in whatever role you're in. Uh, this is sometimes called self-agency or agency. This is, uh, you know, this is the, the psychologist's definition of, of uh, uh, the sense of agency, an individual's capacity to initiate and perform actions and thus bring about change both in their own state, that internal peace, that reflective peace, and in the state of the outside world. And so this notion of autonomy, of self-agency, is deeply rooted in the study of, of the human brain and the human mind. Uh, this, is, this is from a, a, an article on the sense of human agency and is it metacognitive. This is something that actually those who want to study the human mental and, and uh, mental process are deeply interested in. Why do we think we have a choice? There's a certain level I don't care. I mean, it's a deeply interesting question uh, uh, intellectually. But what matters to me is that I have a sense of choice, therefore I exercise it, therefore I can exercise skills of leadership and influence the world and make a difference within it. And, and I think that's something that's incredibly important and something that we've tried to instill within you through the process of making you choose pathways. And I love this picture because it has two things in it. So one, there's the train. The train has no choice. It's just going down the track. There's no left, no right, no choices. And, and when I look at this picture, the train's not actually the important piece. It's, it's cool because it represents a pathway. But it's the doors, right? The doors are the choices. The doors are where you exercise self-agency. The doors are where you develop and, and strengthen your autonomy. And the doors through doing that exercise of choices that's where you learn to be a leader. That's where you develop leadership skills through picking which door do I go through, 
finding out how it worked out, and trying it again next time based on new processes, new information, new expectations. And I think that's what's really important and cool about the structure of the Pathways program is by forcing you to make choices, requiring you to make choices, you are developing those skills of leadership that will let you be the leaders and the best. So congratulations on completing this program. Uh, you're terrific, and go blue. That work? Oh, I stole the microphone too. Thank you so much for 